My, my professional bucket list includes lots of cool things that you've read about in my biography, but what it doesn't say is I've had the opportunity to, one, spend most of my life in cutting edge, and my staff say leading edge, areas of pharmacy practice, which continue to excite me every day. Two, I've had the opportunity to make a difference to the patients I've served, the students and residents I've taught, and whose lives I've helped shape, and the projects that I've worked on. It's been a privilege to serve our nation's heroes as a VA pharmacist in that healthcare system for 30 years. And if you told me 30 years ago I was still going to be there and I would have retired from there, I would have said you were crazy. Third, I had the opportunity to be a role model to other professional women. And this one deserves a little more attention. When I set out in my professional life, I thought that women's movement leaders like Gloria Steinem had done all the heavy lifting and my generation would be different. My sister Julie, who was counting her last days until retirement as Dean of External Relations for Western Iowa Technical College, recently sent gift cards to our daughters for a book entitled Lean In by Sheryl Sandberg, Facebook's Chief Operating Officer. Julie included an email to the girls saying she wished someone had told her all this stuff when she was their age 35 years ago. While Sandberg's book has received controversial reviews, as a good COO, she does know how to delegate and her writing partners are experts on gender and social inequality who have helped produce a well-referenced book on current facts about gender gaps. The astonishing fact for me was that while Sandberg graduated from Harvard in 1995, a full 20 years after I graduated from pharmacy school, many of the social gender issues today are the same as then. She asks a lot of important questions about why after two to three generations of liberated women, the goal of true equality still eludes us. In the last 30 years, it turns out women have made more progress in the workforce than in the home. According to the most recent analysis, when a husband and wife are both employed full time, the mother does 40% more housework than the father. She also spends more time in childcare. A 2009 survey found that only 9% of women in dual earned marriages said that they shared housework, childcare, and breadwinning equally. She invites women to lean into their chosen professional roles, even when society is telling us to lean back. All of us, men and women alike, have to understand that and acknowledge how stereotypes and biases shape our belief and perpetuate the status quo. A list of women who leave countries is very small, as is the list of top-head business executives. However, however, in pharmacy, there exists a more gender-neutral workplace because of the relatively equal number of men and women in our field. This is probably why I've been so interested to read, to read Lean In and discover that in society, women haven't come nearly as far in domestic and leadership roles as I thought. The fact of women, excuse me, the, the face of pharmacy has changed as more women make up the ranks of pharmacy profession. Men have been graduated. Women have been graduating from colleges and colleges and schools of pharmacy at a higher rate than men for over 20 years, and men are retiring at a faster rate than women. These two trends combined have resulted in a practicing profession comprised of a greater percentage of women. Yet despite these trends, a smaller percentage of women hold upper management positions or tenured faculty positions or have risen to the level of dean in academia. Just as in other fields, family issues are felt to be a major factor. Women are still responsible for the majority of child care and housework, regardless of their employment, marital, or parental status. From an early age, girls in all societal environments give the message that they will have to choose between succeeding at work and being a good mother. A woman interested in having children starts to make decisions that affect her job performance long before she actually has children. Often, without even realizing it, a woman stops reaching for those new career opportunities. She not only doesn't become the big L leader that Sarah White has referred to, but she doesn't even raise her hand to become the little leader of any leadership roles at work. She tends to fall back when opportunities are presented instead of leaning in to take on advancement opportunities and promotion potential prior to childbirth. These decisions affect many more years in a woman's career now than necessary. 
By the time the baby actually arrives, the woman is likely to be in a drastically different position in her career than she would have been if she not leaned, had she not leaned back. She may feel underutilized or less fulfilled when she does return to the workplace, and even if financially able, she may choose not to work. The changing nature of pharmacy employment, with the growing of large national pharmacy chains and hospital systems, along with the related decline of independent pharmacies, has played a key role in the creation of a more family-friendly, female-friendly pharmacy profession. In fact, I found several reports calling pharmacy the most egalitarian of all the U.S. professions today for hourly wage. The gap between how much a woman makes compared to men, currently on average at 82% in the United States, is only 92% in pharmacy. So despite the fact that we make 10% less and it's not perfect, we have made big strides in the right direction to labor market gender equality. However, even though pharmacists can earn a near equal hourly wage for equal jobs, after controlling for women's lack of higher paying leadership jobs, many pharmacists, males, continue to continue to earn higher income levels than female pharmacists. Mary and I, and I were the last ceiling breakers at, in the line of ASAP presidents. I was also the first female pharmacist on the United State Board of Pharmacy. And I've had lots of firsts for a woman in this profession. On more occasions than I can count, women in pharmacy have made it clear to me that and I'm aware that they are looking and asking for my experienced help as an enter in the workplace. We struggle with many of the same social factors that impact the larger healthcare community. So maybe I do have one or two more things left on my professional bucket list, but I have less time to make a difference. Art Buckwall said, I don't know if it's the best of times or the worst of times, but I assure you, it's the only time you've got. We are all too soon reminded that our earthly time is very short compared to our attempts to have an impact on what's on our bucket list, and ultimately conclude that change is much slower than we think. 38 years ago, I graduated from the University of Iowa College of Pharmacy. Go Hawkeyes! I took a clinical faculty position there, and my practice site was a little town called Mechanicsville, Iowa, which is north of Iowa City. This was a town of about 800 people that had lost their only medical doctor and pharmacist. Town leaders came to the university for help. A model family practice health clinic staffed by family practice physician, a clinical pharmacist, a nurse, and a receptionist were started. I arrived there in 1995, the fourth in the line of amazing clinical pharmacists. The practice was very unique in that the physician saw the patient in a traditional exam room, made a diagnosis, and then brought the patient down the hall to a small room that doubled as a pharmacy and a consultation office. The pharmacist and the physician decided jointly on a course of treatment together, and the pharmacist prepared the prescription for the patient, counseled them, and made a plan for follow-up. The physician diagnosed, the pharmacist treated. That was 38 years ago. I thought he'd be doing that everywhere by now. So, so why haven't we? What's still on pharmacy's bucket list as I complete my own career bucket list? I'd like to spend the rest of my time with you tonight discussing three things that I think are still on pharmacy's bucket list. The first on my pharmacy bucket list is creating a demand for clinical pharmacy services as an essential health care service. In our effort to make health care more affordable, include 51 million Americans who lack sufficient health care coverage, and improve the quality of health care, many Americans will soon be offered new insurance coverage through health care marketplaces, formerly called health care exchanges. And even while the states debate if they're going to participate, and consumer polls show that 72, excuse me, 42% of Americans are unaware that this is even the law. New provisions of the Affordable Care Act will go into effect this October for many years and for many years to come. Qualified health plans will offer bronze, silver, gold, and platinum coverage, but all must cover 10 essential categories of benefits and services. These services include hospitalization, ambulatory and emergency care, 
It includes maternity and newborn care, mental health and substance use disorders, which have to have the same deductible as other services. It includes preventive and wellness care, pediatric services, laboratory and rehabilitation services and devices, and prescription drugs. Our society has determined that prescription drug coverage is one of the essential health benefits that must be included in health plans. However, clinical pharmacy service isn't. This direct patient care service is known by a variety of terms, including medication therapy management, comprehensive medication management, collaborative drug therapy management, pharmaceutical care. And since I'm never really sure which of these terms is meaningful to people, for the rest of my presentation, I'll be referring to these services as clinical pharmacy or pharmacy direct patient care services. Most pharmacists will continue to work for large organizations or corporations. New incentives to share cost savings will expand accountable care organizations. As more people enroll in marketplaces in the future years, there will be requirements for clinical quality measure results reporting, accreditation of plans in order to participate, and a much bigger need for data-driven health care. Instead of fee-for-service, more and more patients will be paid by value-based reimbursement. Our hope as clinical pharmacists is that in these efforts to improve care, pharmacists who provide direct patient care will find a niche. While we also hope that the total cost of care will decrease, the number of prescriptions filled will very likely increase, especially for those patients who are new to this essential health benefit. Pharmacists and the public must determine if services of clinical pharmacists are as essential a health care benefit and if they are, how they will be reimbursed for those services. All of us in this room know this looks like the perfect storm. An increase in the number of Americans with prescription coverage, an increase in accompanying preventable drug-related morbidity and mortality, and no clinical pharmacy services. For those of us with the greatest ability to have an impact and understand this area, this should be a great concern. No, the dental and optometry services are not essential. These professions have developed plans for consumers to pay for those services for those that can afford them. Should pharmacy and clinical services also be available only as an add-on service for those who can pay? Should medication management be available only in health systems or other, and, or only on some inpatient wards or some specific patient populations as part of value-based reimbursement? Even those of us who boast the best clinical pharmacy services know we aren't able to provide that level of quality care to all our patients. There is great variability. As our country works toward a universal vision of health care coverage throughout the continuum of care, pharmacy should be finding the core clinical functions and develop ratios of pharmacists needed to provide every patient with those services. There simply aren't enough of us now employed to do the job. We see that more pharmacists are graduating annually from ACPD-accredited colleges of pharmacy, and we worry about an oversupply. Yet, we've only scratched the surface to solve the drug-related problems and improve medication outcomes for our patients. What's more, we have data that support that these activities are cost-effective in all healthcare environments. Many critical reviews have been done demonstrating that the median ratio of benefit to cost is that for every dollar spent on clinical pharmacy services, $4.8 dollars is returned to the health system. And we are far ahead of other professions in our ability to show value. Other large social issues, such as marriage between same-sex couples, immigration reform, and even emergency contraception available to young women receive heavy media coverage. As social awareness grows, you can almost feel the pendulum of public opinion changing social norms on these issues. However, the need to provide a mandatory safety net of pharmacy services for the inevitable drug-related problems that will follow is not part of social concerns yet. We need to lean in to any opportunity we have to create a sense of urgency and to publicize and market this disparity as a public health concern. We need to lean in and the public, to corporate leaders, the public, hospital and health system leaders, public policy makers must understand that pharmacists can expand their roles to assist with this problem. We 
we must communicate in clear terms the adverse impact of a product only prescription benefit without services to assure effective, safe, and cost effective patient use of that benefit. Next on my pharmacy bucket list is pharmacist provider success. I've heard a lot about this this week, and I'm really glad. Because now this has been on the pharmacy bucket list as long as I can remember, and I'm really old. <laughs> Many pharmacy organizations have made this their top legislative priority with dollars allocated to the costs. We know there is a shortage of primary care providers, which will reach critical proportion in the coming years as baby boomers age. It's been estimated that in primary care physicians with a panel size of 2,500 follow recommendations for common clinical guidelines, he or she would spend 7.4 hours a day doing recommended preventive care. 10.6 hours per day doing recommended chronic care, and 3.7 hours doing acute care. This amounts to 22 hours a day to care for patients. No wonder, Nikki, that you went into ED medicine, and why no other physicians are going into this practice site. We also know that the management of chronic disease consumes the majority of healthcare resources, and the pharmacists providing direct patient care can assist to resolve both these issues. In 2011, the VA provided approximately 80 million outpatient visits and 700,000 inpatient admissions to over 6 million patients in our nearly 1,000 outpatient clinics and 152 medical centers. The VA is currently the largest health system in the United States. And I say that because I'm pretty sure one of these accountable care organizations is going to get bigger real fast. To deal with these impossible primary care expectations, Teams have organized into medical homes that we in the VA call patient-aligned care teams, or PACs. Medical homes that best describe as a model or philosophy of primary care that is patient-centered, comprehensive, team-based, coordinated, accessible, and focused on quality and safety. It has been a widely accepted model of how primary care should be organized and delivered throughout the healthcare system. The VA's vision of clinical pharmacy specialists, or CPSs, which is a credentialed pharmacy provider in PACT, is to have one pharmacist for every 3,600 patients. That means one CPS for every three teams of 1,200 patients. While well, this is our working ratio, we really have no idea if this is adequate for care. We're just trying this out to see if it is, because no one's ever done it. The clinical pharmacy specialist is assigned to and actively participates in primary care teams providing chronic disease management for patients between visits with their primary care provider and assists with meeting disease state goals. Have we met these CPS ratios for all patient teams? No. However, we are working hard to increase the number of pharmacists involved in direct patient care to meet the needs of our patients. The VA currently employs 7,100 pharmacists. And if the numbers are correct, that's about 10% of all health system pharmacists in the United States. We have the largest number of SHP accredited residents this year, 560. There are over 2,700 pharmacists, that's a full 38% of the total, that now have advanced practice scopes, excuse me, advanced practice with a scope of practice in the VA. That includes performing physical and verbal assessment, ordering and interpreting drug-related tests, referring patients to other health care providers, prescribing medication, and many other provider-level functions. Last year, clinical pharmacy specialists have advanced postgraduate training in the form of residency, fellowship, and award, and award certification. While we have been able to advance within the VA to provider status, we still can't be considered licensed independent practitioners because that's governed by state law. We need to put this on our bucket list right after provider status. And right after that, we need to start working on our clinical practice referral network. But I think I'm getting ahead of myself. <laughs> In most states, pharmacists can apply for collaborative drug therapy management status to their boards of pharmacy. CDTM is a team approach to healthcare delivery whereby a pharmacist and prescriber establish written guidelines and protocols authorizing the pharmacist to initiate, modify, or continue drug therapy for a specific patient. Many pharmacists now wish to provide these and other direct patient care services more independently. The official provider list, or 
for fee for service, excuse me, the official provider list for fee for service care is maintained by the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services, CMS. This list governs which services a profession can provide as well as payment for these services. Our approach has been a legislative effort to add pharmacists to this list of, for cognitive services to non-physician providers. Although current Medicaid Part D law does reimburse pharmacies for pharmacists providing some cognitive services, including medication therapy management, to a select subset of patients, the program is restrictive and encompasses only a small set of services pharmacists are capable of undertaking. Yet having our name on that all-elusive list of CMS providers for this essential health care service has eluded us. We all need to lean into this one. There is also a rules-based, not legislatively driven, provider list that is maintained for value-based reimbursement processes. I would recommend that it's time, that the time is right to petition the Secretary of Health and Human Services to be added to this list of health care providers as well, so that pharmacists working in accountable care organizations and other value-based systems can apply for credentialing and privileging more easily. Both California and Massachusetts have bills in their states seeking legislative authority for pharmacists provider status. We all need to lean into this continued legislative effort in any way we can. For decades, we have focused on giving women the choice to work inside or outside the home. We have celebrated the fact that women have the right to make this decision, and rightly so. In the same way, we have two very important processes of patient care that pharmacists fulfill. We have many pharmacists that are deeply entrenched in order fulfillment activities and function well within their current scope of practice. Just as it's time to cheer on men and women who want to sit at the table, seek leadership challenges, and lean into their careers, it's also time to do the same for pharmacists who want to evaluate patients, prescribe medications, and assist to ensure optimal outcomes of medication therapy. There are certainly enough drug-related problems to be solved, and too few of us to do it. Now, pharmacists have spent many years preparing for provider status. In fact, there are most of the health professions out there who would love to be us. We have revamped and upgraded our educational and academic programs to a doctorate level for all. PharmD graduates have to pass standardized NAPLEX exams. You know that they have to be assessed for minimum knowledge to practice. They have to have special hours to demonstrate knowledge of state and federal laws and internships. Postgraduate education includes two levels of residencies, PGY1, PGY2, fellowships, masters of science, PhD degrees are also available as are traineeships and certificate programs in specialized areas. In addition, you can demonstrate proficiency as being a board certificate certified pharmacist. BPS has now credentialed nearly 16,000 board certified pharmacists, and they expect that number to double in the next five years. <coughs> I checked with Jan Teeters, and after this year, we will have trained 32,400 ASHP accredited pharmacy residents. Pharmacy has always been so concerned about which pharmacists should be providers. Should we allow all pharmacists to prescribe medication, or just those with some additional credential? I sometimes think we are our own worst enemy in our ability to countlessly argue about this process. Let's just apply the same principles we accept in society, and that is that there's more than one way to get across the road. Which credentials will be needed will be determined by the type of direct patient care service provided. While, there's a, while it's often difficult to explain all these credentials to others outside of pharmacy, the current pathway for achieving, demonstrating, and maintaining competence as clinical pharmacists is not an obstacle to us obtaining provider status. As pharmacists, we are capable and competent providers. However, it's probably not a one-size-fits-all approach. Some combination of all these credentials is sufficient for provider status that allows an advanced scope of practice that will improve medication outcomes for our patients. Third on my bucket list is a framework for credentialing and privileging for all practice sites. In addition to answering this age-old question of which pharmacists should be providers, we seem to continually ask what services these pharmacists will provide. 
As pharmacy has evolved, we have always talked about two parallel processes of patient care, both centered around the patient and medication use process. At first, it was pharmacists and clinical pharmacists. Even in the VA, we have clinical pharmacists and clinical pharmacy specialists. There will be pharmacists who want to be providers and those that don't. There are still environments where pharmacists who want to be providers shouldn't or can't. Could all pharmacists be providers? Yeah, I think eventually maybe they could. But right now, many practice environments aren't ready for them. Access to health records and patient information, as well as practice model support to allow time and acceptance by teams and patients will limit this activity for many. However, just as societal biases shape our views of gender issues, so we must resist the temptation to continue to allow pharmacy biases to perpetuate the status quo. For example, the electronic health record has changed practice in any system that has one. My Veteran Integrated Service Network and Visit 21 group has spent the last 10 years developing a clinical data warehouse to do pharmacoepidemiology and pharmacovigilance in populations of patients on medications. To me, this has been a very rewarding practice. In fact, it's kind of like clinical pharmacy on steroids. Our group is defining what the role of health analytic pharmacists are in our practice model and training future pharmacists to fill this void with our PGY2 residency. When I started my career 38 years ago, I could not have imagined a practice of patient population management by health analytics. But here it is. As a result, we have created what is yet the third parallel pharmacy process of patient care. It's now common for pharmacists to use health analytics to identify high-risk patients who do not achieve a variety of performance, safety, and quality goals and to assist in coordinating and providing disease management alone or with teams to achieve therapeutic outcomes. These pharmacists run programs have now demonstrated reduction in 30-day readmission rates and overall hospital admissions. So now we have pharmacist roles that include primary order fulfillment, primary drug patient care, and primarily population management. We need to encourage all new role development as long as they contribute to advancing our practice model. But the point is that practice models change and evolve, and so should scopes of practice and credentialing of pharmacists. I urge all practice sites to develop a framework to standardize credentialing and scope of practice oversight of pharmacists who provide direct patient care. Employers, and this is chain pharmacists as well as university hospitals, who agree to allow pharmacists the necessary access to patients' health information and the time to provide direct patient care should set up standardized credentialing processes as part of their patient as their patient models evolve. Employers have the opportunity to proactively develop this framework now, or they may it may be left to payers or regulatory bodies later. A high-performing pharmacy must be able to determine what a pharmacist provider does what credentials they need to do it, based on feasibility, financial return, strategic focus of the organization, and the effect on quality and safety. However, we need to continue to be able to recognize high performance and make sure that we don't hang a new banner over an old practice. What is good for business may or may not always be good for patients. In conclusion, many years ago, I was told as a woman that I could have I really wish instead I would have been advised to lean in. Don't select professional options already looking for the exit. Don't put the brakes on, but rather accelerate through life's transitions. Keep your foot on the gas pedal until a decision must be made. That's the, really the only way to ensure that when that day comes, there will be a real decision to make. As pharmacists, we are really ready to take a bigger role in direct patient care to improve drug therapy outcomes. All of us have to understand and acknowledge how stereotypes and biases have shaped societal beliefs and perpetuate the status quo, whether we're talking about gender or pharmacy services. During this unprecedented transition of healthcare reform, I challenge you to remember we are the health profession with the strongest knowledge, skill, and ability to manage and reduce the C of drug-related morbidity and mortality we see in our daily professional lives. 
harvest innovative clinical practice, share your experiences within pharmacy organizations and beyond, and encourage your healthcare teams to talk and publish the role of clinical pharmacy impact on patient care. While we all have to ensure that we can speak the same language within pharmacy, we also need to ensure that others can sing our praises. Closer to the end of my career than at the beginning, my bucket list is thankfully pretty short. Pharmacy, however, has a couple of age-old items on our bucket list that I'd really like to see some transformational progress on before I fade into the sunset. Regardless of your personal choice in career path, it is really time for all pharmacists to lean in to provider status. Establish a credentialing process in all pharmacy environments so that we can make drug patient care services an essential health care service for all our patients, even when society might be telling us to lean back. Progress often depends upon taking risks, advocating for ourselves, and agreeing on the necessary steps and framework needed to get there. This is an unprecedented time for us all to lean in together. Thank you.